The Orioles are 30 games over 500. They sit in first place in the toughest division in baseball with a 99% odds to make the playoffs. They got an incredible farm system, including the number one prospect in baseball. The vibes are high in Birdland. And yet, John Angelos just can't help himself by trying to make it about him and have everything come crashing down. Talk about what Angelos' latest snafu was and how it impacts the Orioles for the short and long term. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. There, Orioles fans, today is Tuesday, August 22nd, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, well, it was an off day on Monday. The O's got the day off after sweeping Oakland this weekend and then welcoming in the Toronto Blue Jays tonight, but it couldn't just be all good. For the first place, O's. No, no, no. John Angelos was profiled in the New York Times on Monday morning. And the things he said were not good at all for the future of the Orioles. So we'll talk about the just weird, heinous comments he made about the team, the payroll, and the future. We'll talk about the financials, about all the lies he spewed in his first time talking since the Kevin Brown situation. And then we'll talk about specifically his thoughts on not extending these young Orioles players, and what that means for the team moving forward. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB and enter promo code locked on MLB and you'll get a free white tech hat with any order of the awesome Bird Dog shorts and pants. You won't want to take your Bird Dogs off. We promise you that. So let's talk John Angelos, right? He did it again. An Orioles off day, right? There's no game to talk about here on a Tuesday episode after the O's swept the A's. They're in first place. Got a huge series with Toronto starting tonight. And John Angelos, just like with the news on Kevin Brown breaking on a Monday off day, some more John Angelos news breaks on a Monday again. Let's start with, if you missed it, what did you miss? Well, on Monday morning in the New York Times, not the Baltimore Sun, not the Baltimore Banner, the New York Times, which still has sports coverage, apparently. Tyler Kepner, who is a, a great writer who's covered baseball for 20, 30 years now, and a lot of it at the Times, releases basically a profile, not exactly a profile, but a story where he talked to John Angelos about the Orioles, the financials, the lease, Kevin Brown, and the future of the team. It did not go well. I just want to get out of the way a couple of the things that were kind of sparsely in there, but let's kind of start with the article itself. Go check it out in the New York Times. If you just put your email in, you can get one free article to read. So even if you're not subscribed, you can still check it out. I saw some pushback about it being like a puff piece from the New York Times and, and Tyler Kepner kind of writing in good light about John Angelus. That is not how I saw this piece at all, first of all. I saw it as Kepner just allowing Angelos to speak. John Angelos making a fool out of himself again, and Kepner kind of just publishing his quotes, lightly making fun of him, and poking fun of him, essentially. that That's how I read this. Maybe that's from a biased viewpoint a little bit, but that's how I and a lot of people read this. Like, if you're smart enough to read between the lines of what Kepner's writing, what Angelos is saying, you know that this does not make him look good and is not a puff piece at all. Overall picture, for this to be the time and place where Angelos and his team, the Orioles PR team, Angelos' PR team, his henchmen, trying to get some good graces after the disaster that was the Kevin Brown situation. Going to the New York Times, you could say what you want about the New York Times, but going to the Times for a puff piece for some good PR and you say the things you say and think that's going to smooth it over, just another incredibly terrible move by John Angelos and his PR team. Like, he just... Either A, doesn't have a true PR person, or B, has one and doesn't listen to them and goes against their wishes. Or maybe has one and they're just terrible at their job. I guess that's C. Because it's just a disaster. I mean, first of all, the fact that he is even addressing 
the Kevin Brown situation in this story when he is trying to put a positive spin on the lease and the future of the O's financially. Uh, why? And it was almost like, I mean, I'm sure Kepner asked him about it right when he's interviewing him. But the way it came off was like Angelos brought it up unprompted. And at the end of his quote about the Kevin Brown situation, he said, nothing like that is going to happen again. It shouldn't have happened once. And the way he talked about it was basically, hey, you know, we're going to review our processes for, you know, suspending employees and take a look at that. My brother in Christ, you did this. That was your policy. You suspended him. And whether it was Angelos directly or it was Angelos's people seeing it and just saying you're suspended, that's what John would want, it's bad enough that John has set that precedent. Him going out there and saying it's not going to happen again. It shouldn't have happened once. It's the I think you should leave me wearing the hot dog suit. We're all looking for the guy who did this. It was you, John. And every single person reading that is smart enough to know he's just talking out of his you-know-what. That that was maybe the most ridiculous thing he said in the entire piece. Then there's the ballpark stuff, right? I, I mean, even reported before this New York Times story, the Baltimore Sun and the Baltimore Banner over the last couple of weeks had done a great job further reporting about John Angelos and this kind of journey to sign this lease before the deadline on December 31st. I mean, we're sitting here. We're about four months away, John. Like, what are you doing here? Well, the Sun and the Banner reported that Angelos, even though as long as he just signs the lease, the Maryland Stadium Authority has earmarked $600 million for him and the Orioles to make improvements on the ballpark. That is a lot of money. If you think about it, this was written about in the Baltimore Sun and in the Banner on Monday. The Milwaukee Brewers were looking for $300 million to improve their stadium, couldn't get it from the state, and are now threatening to leave. The Orioles are getting double that, $600 million, and he wants more. Great reporting in the Sun and the Banner about how he wants more than that. He is looking for $300 additional million dollars to develop land and the parking lots around the stadium to kind of make essentially a copy of the battery in Atlanta. When the Atlanta Braves built their new stadium a few years ago, they built the battery, which is just an area around the stadium that has bars and restaurants and different places to go and shops where, you know, yes, it's buzzing on game day, but even if there's not a game, it's still a place people go to. And it's a nice idea, right? It seems to be a fun place that people enjoy in Atlanta. But Angelos wants $300 million to develop land that he does not own, that the Orioles do not own. It is public land, parking lots owned by the city. And not only does he want those spaces, which are owned by the city and used by the citizens, he then also wants not just the land from the citizens, he wants $300 million more million from the taxpayers as well. What is that ask when you're already getting $600 million, which is more than anybody gets? to just upgrade a stadium. It's not building a new one just to upgrade one. No one gets that much money. And you want 300 more for stuff that's not yours. And here's the thing. Him and Wes Moore, you know, went down back in February, whenever it was, to check out the battery in Atlanta because they want to build it like that. That's all fine and dandy. It can't really work where the stadium is. First of all, you have M&T Bank Stadium right there. And oh yeah, they didn't have a problem signing the lease, getting their 600 million and starting to plan out their additions. The reason the Braves were able to do this so well. And to be fair, like I was at the St. Louis Cardinal Stadium, Bush Stadium earlier this summer. They have a nice little ballpark village. Now they don't have the full battery with everything, but they have a nice little ballpark village and it still is in downtown St. Louis. It's still in the city. So they've done a good job with that. But the reason why, like everybody says, oh, the battery in Atlanta, that's the best one. It's because they moved the team out of the city. The stadium is not in Atlanta. It's in the neighboring Cobb County. It's like 13 miles outside the city or something. And there was so much more land to work with, so much more man land to develop, and much cheaper land because it was outside the city. That's how the Braves were able to do that. Angelus wants to do it in an already crowded city where the land is much more expensive and doesn't want to pay for it. In fact, wants it and then wants more money to develop on it. What goes on in his head? Like, I get he's one of the dumber people out there, was born on third base and still couldn't pass the bar. When his whole family's lawyers, I mean, come on, John, you, you paying attention to anything? You got anything going on in there? But otherwise, 
like he's delaying the process. And the Sun reported this a couple of weeks ago too, that when it was coming down to the initial deadline that they had then extended until December 31st, the Maryland government said they didn't hear from Angelos for like days on end until the lease just passed. And then they realized that he was extending it and he was not going to sign it basically with the old regime. And he was going to wait for Wes Moore and his people, his buddy Wes Moore, who contributes a lot of money to. Not really sure if Moore and Angelos are actually friends or if John just gives him a lot of money and he says he's his friend. Either way, he just left the Larry Hogan administration in the cold. Now, I can get into my thoughts about the Larry Hogan administration, but Angelos just not doing his job and was completely delaying time where they could have been working on this lease. And he just said, no, I only want to talk to my friend. He's ridiculous. And, and he talks to New York Times about like all this stuff he wants to do around the stadium, right? He wants to, you know, build a, a school in the warehouse. He wants to put youth programs in there and, and you know, do all this stuff that's going to help out the city. That's great. Is a school really going to work in the warehouse? Have you thought about the logistics of that? Or is that John just saying something to say, oh, look at all these great things I'm going to do for the city with this money that I'm trying to fleece from the city and the taxpayers? You read the article again and again, and he just comes off worse and worse every single time. And that is just the start of it. Because the stuff he said about the Orioles' financials, the payroll, the future of the team, was somehow, somehow so much worse. And I'll tell you how coming up next. But first... This episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Bird Dogs. I've talked about Bird Dogs before, but they are the most comfortable pairs of shorts I have ever owned. And the Bird Dogs, they make you look good. These stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit th thimmer through the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. And the shorts... They're just like those Lululemon shorts that are popular, but they fit actually way better. And they have this cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches. So you can wear them to really any occasion because they can be lounging shorts. They can be athletic shorts, but they can make you look good if you're going to a little bit nicer event in the summer as well. And the best part of the bird dogs in the summer, it's 90 degrees in Baltimore. Bird dogs uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. I love the bird dogs. I currently have three pairs of the shorts. I wish I had seven so I could just wear them every single day in the summer. That's how much I love the bird dogs. And if you go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB or enter the promo code locked on MLB, you can get a free white tech hat with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on MLB or promo code locked on MLB for a free white tech hat. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. So despite the Orioles playing great baseball, as I mentioned, John Angelos just had to butt in and say, everybody look at me, not this team where the one piece of credit I'll give to John Angelos, right, is that unlike his dad, Peter, who really thought he knew ball and he didn't, John has kind of taken a hands-off approach on the on-field product. He has allowed Mike Elias, Sig Dell, and Eve Rosenbaum to take over that, and they have turned a team with 110 losses, well, they made the team be that bad, first of all, but in two years, in first place in the American League. It's pretty impressive. He has been hands-off. Unfortunately, that's given him more time to make a fool of himself in every other spot that comes with being an owner of a Major League Baseball team. Literally every single one. So I talked about kind of the stuff he's saying in this article, past things, but let's talk about the financial things that he talked about, because that's a lot of what this article was in the New York Times on Monday, as a lot of it was about the financials. Let's start with what John said about market size, because this is something that is such an outdated, a lot of this is just outdated information, but I really want to set the record straight on a lot of stuff because there's research done. There's numbers out there that completely disprove pretty much everything John said in that article. Let's start with market size. Angelus was talking about how the Orioles are in a quote, small market. And yes, if you look at media markets, if you look at average income, whatever it may be in the area, it is in the bottom half of the cities that have Major League Baseball teams. And John said, the hardest thing to do in professional sports is be a small market team in baseball. Went on to talk about how, you know, it means you can't spend as much money, you, you can't 
you know, throw out as much money to free agencies, to player, whatever it may be, and and talked about how he needs to raise the prices of everything to you know really pay players. We'll get to that in a second. But let's start with market size. Market size means a little bit, right? I mean, you're at an advantage if you're at a better market. There's no denying that. But other than that, market size, especially in baseball, means almost nothing. Remember, there is no salary cap. There's a couple of luxury tax thresholds where if you get to that number, you pay a higher tax on, on what you're paying. But otherwise, it really doesn't mean anything. Let's look at the Orioles. They are the number 28 national market, number 24 among baseball teams, but generally number 28 in the U.S. media market. Compare them to the San Diego Padres, who as of data at the beginning of 2023 were the 30th ranked media market. They're basically one media market below the Orioles in terms of Major League Baseball. Now, I understand that the Padres have had a really tough year. What, five, six games under 500 sitting outside the playoff picture? But this Padres team has a $255 million payroll. That is the third highest payroll in all of baseball. And they, if you're going to call teams this, they are undoubtedly a small market team. And yet, only the Mets and the Yankees have a higher payroll than the Padres right now. And I get that, yes, they're not playing great baseball this year, but that Padres team used that payroll to get to the NLCS last season. And they were very close to getting to the World Series in 2022. It works if you're paying players. Now, they're not doing as much winning this year. And think about, I mean, the O's have better baseball ops people. They've done better at developing players. There is no doubt about that. But if you're trying to argue, well, it just can't be done in Baltimore, right? It's too small a market. We can't do it. We'd have to, you know, raise the ticket sales. Even if we did that, we couldn't do it. Peter Seidler came on board with the Padres in 2012. He is now the principal owner. Back then, he was just kind of part of the ownership group when he came on board. Got full control in 2020. Between there and then, he was spending, helping spend more and more money. The Padres were just, I mean, in the 2000s, the Padres were nothing. They were basically the, the NL Orioles. They were not really part of the playoffs very many years at all. They were kind of an afterthought. They were kind of a joke of a franchise at times after, you know, the Tony Gwynn era. And then they spent a little more money and a little more money and they spent on Manny Machado. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you get in Tatis and you extend him and you bring in, you know, the big contracts like Joe Musgrove and Darvish and Blake Snell and Hassan Kim and Cronenworth and Xander Bogarts this off season. And all of a sudden, Seidler comes in and just says, I'm spending my money. Don't care what the market size is. And he turns them into the third payroll. I'm not saying John Angelos has to elevate the Orioles to $250 million payroll from their $65 million payroll they have right now, which is 29th in baseball. Okay? Only above Oakland. I don't say they have to do that. They've shown this year they're 30 games over 500 with the second lowest payroll. They can win like that. But imagine if Angelos just said, let's get to the middle of the pack. They were there in the Buck Showalter years. You know, in the mid-2010s, they were about a middle of the pack spending team. They actually slipped into the top 10 one of those years. They can do it. Back in the 90s, when the O's went to back-to-back -to -back ALCSs, they were top five. In 1998, the year after they went to the ALCS and won the division in 97, the O's had the number one highest paid team in baseball. $60 million was their payroll. That was number one in baseball in 1998. They can do it before with this family. It's such an outright lie that it can't be done. I mean, even look at a team like the Cardinals. They're basically right above the Orioles in market size. Not only do they spend on players now, not ridiculously, I mean, $178 million payroll, right? That's 14th in baseball this year. That is what the O's should be shooting for. And the Cardinals basically every year are right around like the bottom of the top 10, top 15 at worst every year. And they've been a winning baseball team. This is the first year in a very long time that the Cardinals have had a bad season. They've been one of the most consistent franchises in baseball and they're kind of a small market team, but they've spent like a mid to upper market team. They haven't gone crazy, but they've done enough to have a winning baseball team out there every single season. The Orioles should be shooting for, hey, let's get to 120, 130, 150. Let's get in the top 20, the top 15. You can easily do it. All this stuff about market size is just, it's a complete and utter lie. Now, the other part of this, and again, listen, if you just get a rich owner, Steve Cohen, I mean, I know he owns the Mets. That's a big market. You can just come in and spend as much money as you want. Peter Seidler came in, spent as much money as he wants on the Padres. You combine that, not even 250, maybe 150 million with the player development of the Orioles. 
boom, you've got the Dodgers. That is the Dodgers right there. You combine Orioles player development with at least top half of the league spending. Doesn't have to be top three, maybe top 15. That's the Dodgers right there. Wouldn't you like to be the Dodgers? They got a pretty good thing going on over there. But let's talk about what John kind of followed up with. Talking about, hey, we're going to have to raise prices here drastically. When he's talking about, you know, if he's going to pay for free agents, extend players, basically spend money. We're going to have to raise prices as in tickets, concessions, team store, all that stuff. Just as big a lie as the market share thing. Pretty much everybody knows that, yes, there is some kind of correlation between the ticket sales and the money you, you, you know, charge for them. You're making more money if your tickets are more expensive and you're selling out the games than if your tickets are less expensive. Yeah, you're getting more money. But that's a drop in the hat compared to the money you are guaranteed by revenue sharing and other things every single year. Let's break it down right now. Each team, just from revenue sharing, this is teams making money, getting some of it, splitting some of the rest of it, and sending it out to everybody else. The Orioles and every team get $110 million approximately every year just from revenue sharing. They just have to show up and they get $110 million. That's a pretty good start right there. That's more than the operating costs of the team right there. Next thing. From national TV deals. This is not the regional sports networks. This is national TV deals. So the deals with ESPN and with Fox and with Peacock and with Apple TV and all these streaming services and channels that games are on nationally. Each team every year gets a cut of $60 million. Each team got a $60 million cut from the TV deals. Okay, let's add that in. Boom, you're up to 170. Now, add in the regional sports networks. Although Masson is a dumpster fire run by John Angelos, they get a pretty good payout from Masson. Now, I know it's weird there because Angelos owns both, so it's not like he's getting money from somewhere else sometimes, but they're still making money because Masson's making money. The average is about 40 million, sometimes 50 that you get from that one. Boom, add that one in there. Keep it going. This offseason, MLB, from the technology at BAM Tech that they sold, every single team got $30 million of that cut. Now, that's not coming every year. That was from this offseason. Let's add that in there. You carry the one. You add up some numbers. You say some of these numbers might even be low estimates probably because these numbers aren't like completely – the books aren't open unless you're the Braves. You don't know exactly what it is. Let's call that about $250 million if you add it all up right there. That is without the ticket sales, the food, the team store merchandise, all that stuff. That's just the money you're guaranteed to get for just showing up and putting your games on TV. $250 million. Now, here's a low estimate. Now, a lot of good teams are making about $4 million per game. The Orioles aren't making that. They're not selling out every game. You know, I get it. Let's say they're making a million per game. 80, you know, 80, 80, $81 million right there for 81 home games. So we'll take off some and shave off the other, just make it some nice round numbers. We'll call it $325 million, just about, that the team could get this year from everything. The Orioles are running a $65 million payroll. John Angelos is claiming he's not making money. He's talking about how we got to, you know, not go above our means. We got to keep prices down. You know, if we really want to spend, we got to take the money from you. Right now, they would be up $260 million. Now, I get you got to pay the front office staff and you got to pay the employees. You got to keep the ballpark operating and all that good stuff. You got to pay the food costs, whatever it may be. You're still sitting around $200 million that you have to work with. And that's without John Angelos contributing any of his own money. He is a billionaire with a B. He's a Nepo baby who was born on third base and somehow got picked off over there still. He's a billionaire and he's got $200 million to work with without adding in any of his own money. And in baseball with the no salary cap, rich guy comes in there, you can just spend as much as you want of your own money. Think about that. And he's trying to tell you that baseball isn't profitable, even if you're getting basically a free $250 million this year. You're going to tell me you're not profitable? Are you kidding me right now? 
It's such an outright lie. You don't have to punish the fans by raising prices to pay for players. You just don't have to. It's the biggest lie in the game. Don't believe it. The numbers, spell it out right there. He just lies. All he does is lie. In that story, talks about, we got to find the guy who did this to Kevin Brown. It's you. Lies. Talk about, hey, if I were to open the books, you said you're going to do it three times throughout the season. Didn't do it. It's another lie. All he does is lie and lie and lie because he's bad at his job and he's bad for this team. And if you're telling me that when you're getting a free $250 million and you can't run a team at a profit, that's what you're saying? A, you're lying. B, if you can't do that, I mean, I could do that. I didn't go to business school. I got a journalism degree. I could run the team at a profit at that. Sell the team. If you claim you're not making money, stop losing money then and sell the team. So either A, you're lying, or B, you're stupid. He's both. He's both. But the last thing he talked about, which is really the thing that affects the team on the field the most over than all of this, is how he compared this to the ability to extend players. Because the O's have a lot of young talent right now. And not a lot of them are like coming up, you know, free agents after this year or next year. But that day is going to come pretty soon. The question, you know, every mailbag I do, we get when do the O's extend Gunner? When do the O's extend Adley? It's great questions. A lot of teams have extended their guys already. The O's haven't done it for anyone. Why? I think what Angelo said Monday kind of opens up that answer. Talk about that to finish off the pod coming up next. So it's another day, another John Angelos saying something incredibly stupid. And let's finish it off with what he talked about extensions. Because he basically said in that story that it might not be feasible to keep this Orioles core together like the core of, you know, the Ripkins and so on and so forth in the first run of the World Series and then kind of those 90s teams as well. He basically said it's not going to be possible to do that. If I want to do it, I need to raise prices. We've already talked about how that's a complete lie. And he's just BSing you and he's trying to get out of having to spend any of his money, even though he's a billionaire. But that's going to hurt the team so much because his other quote would be was if we spend 150 million, 200 million on a player, we would be, quote, so financially underwater. And then he did this weird economic word salad that made it look like he opened up an econ 200 textbook from his from the local college, read one page and said, copy paste. This is what I'm saying to Tyler Kepner in The New York Times. It was like. I don't even know what the words he was using financially underwater he's talking about whatever you know goods and services and checks and balances and stocks and bonds and he was just throwing out words from the glossary of the econ textbook he didn't know what he's talking about again he's lying he continues to lie he doesn't know what he's talking about but the issue here is him saying we'd be so financially underwater and it'd be tough to keep this team together he said 150 million dollar extension if you're getting $200 million a year, John, pretty easy to give out a $150 million extension over seven or eight years, if you ask me. Now, I'm not saying the Orioles should be able to give out every big extension, right? That you give the huge one to Gunner and to Adley and to Grayson and to Santander and Mullins and whomever else. John Means, you want to add to this, Kyle Bradish. I get it. You're not going to be able to extend everybody. Nobody can. I mean, really, nobody can. Guys always hit free agency. But at this point, got to do something, right? I mean, looking at guys who become free agents, free agents after this year, you know, it's, it's the Flaherty's, the Gibson's, the, the Adam Frazier's. I don't know if they'll bring those guys back, but free agents after 2024, you already have to make some decisions. John Means, Anthony Santander, both free agents after 2024. Let's get something going there. They're important parts of this team. Free agents after 2025, Cedric Mullins, Austin Hayes, important parts of this team, especially Mullins. Free agents after 2026, Ryan Mountcastle, Ramon Arias, Tyler Wells, Cole Irvin, varying levels of importance, but guys you might want to lock up. And those 2026 guys, they hit arbitration for the first time this offseason. They'd start to become somewhat expensive next year. After 2027, Adley Rutschman, Felix Bautista, Dean Kramer, all becoming free agents. After 2028, Kyle Bradish, Gunnar Henderson, Yenier Cano all become free agents. And then after 2029, you got Jordan Westberg, Colton Kowser, whoever else may come up. And on and on from there, all these great prospects, if you keep them, 
you got to pay them at some point. And again, as I said, you know, they're not going to pay everyone. I understand some of these guys are going to be free agents. That's just how the game works. But when you look around the league, you know, a teams like even the Mariners, not exactly a big market, big spender. They saw Julio was good. They locked him up immediately. We got you. Even teams like the Pirates, they're just above the Orioles in spending, 28th. They've at least extended Brian Reynolds, one of their best players, and they've been talking about extensions with others. The Cincinnati Reds don't spend at all. They've got a very similar owner to the Orioles, yet they were discussing extensions with multiple of their starting pitchers throughout this season. I think they're going to get a deal done with those guys, maybe Ellie De La Cruz and others this offseason. You know, you talk about the Cleveland Guardians. You want to be more like the Guardians, be sustainable. Well, they stink this year, but they at least extended Jose Ramirez, the star of the team. I think the number one thing John Angelos has said, and he said it earlier this year, he wants to be like the Rays. The Rays don't have a high payroll, right? The Orioles are 29th, 65 million. The Rays are 27th at 79 million this year. Yet they're also, you know, they've been a perennial playoff team, got to the World Series in 2020. It is a successful on and off the field organization. And they don't spend a lot of money. They still extend guys, though. They extend a lot of guys, actually. That's the thing. The O's haven't done that at all. And the Rays have spent more in free agency. I mean, yes, the Zach Eflin contract this offseason, three years, $40 million, was the biggest free agent contract the Rays has ever given out. That's kind of sad, but at least they did it. And Eflin's been a really important starting pitcher for the Rays this year and will be for the next two seasons as well. Now, I know the for unforeseen awful, awful circumstances and terrible thing he allegedly has done. But I mean, you have your star in Wander Franco, 11 years, 182 million. If the Rays can do that, the Orioles can do that too with a guy like Adley Rutschman. I mentioned Zach Eflin. Back when Brandon Lau got good, he had turned 2019, six years, 24 million. You're not going to really get guys at that extension anymore, but they did it. They struck while the iron was hot. Jeffrey Springs turned him into a great pitcher last year, four years, $31 million, cheap extension. Yanni Diaz, great year last year, three years, 24 million. Tyler Glass now, you know, getting to arbitration. Let's just lock him up for another year. Two years, 30 million. Keep him around for a little longer before he gets too expensive. Even if you operate like that, you can get these guys when they're younger on cheaper extensions, just extend a couple more years on the end of their free agency. And all those contracts I mentioned all have player or club options at the end. So there's options to extend them by one or two years to get even more value and more time with these guys in your favorite team's uniform. The Rays are as stingy as it gets. They cycle through players. They DFA guys all the time. They're always churning the 40-man roster. As soon as a guy hits arbitration and gets expensive, they either extend him to cut out the arbitration years or they trade him. And they're good. And if the Orioles want to be that, it's annoying, but it can bring success. But they're not even at that level of spending. They're not even extending any of these guys. And it seems like they're not even trying. And I get, you know, Gunnar Henderson is a Scott Boris client. Boris 95% of the time wants his clients to hit free agency because he knows they're going to get the most money there. I get it. And then he'll get the most money there. You still got to try. Adley Rutschman should be a guy you've already locked up right now. Go get Grayson Rodriguez. Even if you're not going to do that, you're not going to give out the big, huge ones. Cedric Mullins is a guy right now who would be perfect for one of those Ray style extensions, right? Like a little three-year 40 some million dollar extension, right? Keep him in Baltimore for for extra years after, you know, he becomes a free agent after 2025. Anthony Santander, you know, his value is probably more to the Orioles than it would be for any other team. He's a free agent after next year. Tack on two more years onto that contract. Get him on a nice team friendly extension. You can get it done. They are choosing not to. And it's not because ticket prices are too low and it's not because they're losing money. They are making money. Every single MLB team does. If you didn't make money, these so-called business people wouldn't want to buy a team immediately when somebody's selling and wouldn't stay in this business. The Angeloses have been in this business since 1993. It's been 30 years of them owning the team. They would have gotten out if they weren't making money. They are making a ton of money. It is a widely lucrative spot to be in to own a baseball team. You've got the money to at the very least. Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander, John Means, Ryan Mountcastle, get him some money, keep some of these guys around. And he won't do it. He lies. He's bad at his job. He takes all of the attention off an incredible Orioles team this year and just puts it on him. 
John Angelos, understand this, is actively working against the Orioles. Maybe not right now because this team is very young and very cheap. He's in a perfect position. You have all this talent still on those rookie deals making the minimum. But as soon as these guys hit arbitration and as soon as they get close to free agency, that's when Angelos will go out and be actively working against this team, saying, trade those guys, don't re-sign them, I'm not going to pay them because I'm losing money. He's not. He's lying. He continues to lie. And he's terrible for baseball here. And I still think he's going to sign the lease. Like, Angelos, as much as he lies, I do think he is committed to Baltimore for whatever reason in his mind he wants to help this city out. I think he's committed here, and I think he's going to sign that lease. But man, every time he lies and says something stupid about the financials and just makes a fool of himself like he did in this New York Times piece, it inches me closer and closer to thinking, would he really move the team to Nashville? I still don't think he would. But can you believe anything else he said? No. So why would I believe him saying the Orioles will stay here as long as Fort McHenry is standing over Baltimore? It's tough to believe anything he's saying when he continues and continues to lie and lie and lie. And it's not going to affect the players now, right? We saw the Kevin Brown thing didn't affect him. This isn't going to affect him. They're going to go out and play their hardest and continue to be one of the best teams in baseball and compete to win a World Series this year. But as this goes on and this team tries to stay good and these great players get more and more expensive, it's going to actively hurt the team that Angelos is not going to extend them. It's going to whine and whine and whine. And maybe he'll say, oh, as long as I get that money for the ballpark, then I'll start to pay players. I don't think so. I think that would be a lie too. I don't love taking the attention away from the team and talking about this, but he makes all the final decisions for this franchise. And I do like that he doesn't meddle in the baseball decisions. But all these other decisions at the end of the day in the long term will affect the baseball on the field. And that's where I'm worried. Maybe not for 2023 or even 2024, but as it moves forward, this team should be able to build a sustainable contender right now. I think Angelos is going to hold them back from doing that. So if you're saying you can't make money and you're saying all these stupid things and you want to live in Nashville, even though you claim you're here in Baltimore all the time and you want to lie and lie and lie. He seems kind of miserable. Just sell the team to someone who actually cares, wants to make the team better, wants to invest in the team, and wants to bring a championship here. Sell the team to someone who actually puts the baseball team over top of the restaurants around the field and the concerts he's putting on. Sell the team. It was great to see A's fans and O's fans come together in this series this weekend. John Fisher, John Angelos, very similar owners. You know what Fisher did? He's moving the team to Las Vegas. Again, I think Angelos will keep the O's here. But every time he speaks, that little shred of doubt grows larger and larger. I don't trust him. He's a little weasel, and he's not good for this ball club. Hopefully, hopefully someone, one of the henchmen, one of the PR people who's bad at their job, one of the Greg Baders, the Jennifer Grandals, can get in his ear and just say, shut up for the rest of the year. Maybe he won't listen because he's full of himself and he's the biggest Nepo baby in the world. He's just a character on succession. But maybe someone can get to him and just say, shut up. But we shall see. That'll do it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening in on my rants. Listen, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll have plenty more baseball to talk about. Game one, Orioles, Blue Jays coming up tonight. Big series, O's 8-2 and two against Toronto final series against the Jays this season. I'll be in the ballpark for tonight's game. Come say hi, reach out if you'd like to hang out and watch a little Orioles baseball. You say Kikuchi is going to go for the Blue Jays in this one. The left-handers having a great season for Toronto. He's got a 3-4-4 ERA on the year in 24 starts. His last one against Philly, six innings, one run, seven strikeouts. His last one against the O's is pretty good too on August 2nd, six innings, one run, and three Ks in that game. Now, Ryan Mountcastle has owned Yusei Kikuchi in his career. He's owned the Blue Jays. Ryan Mountcastle's red hot. That's going to be fun to watch. Kikuchi, he did get hit around by the O's back on May 19th, three runs over four and two-thirds. And then going for the Orioles, 
Going to be a fun one. Grayson Rodriguez on a heater right now, back to the mound with a 5-4-4 ERA on the season in 16 starts. Coming off a dandy in San Diego. Seven innings, a career high, one run, six strikeouts for Grayson Rodriguez. Now, he has faced Toronto already this season. He's actually seen him twice. May 20th in Toronto, five innings of two-run ball with six strikeouts. Pretty solid in that one. And then August 2nd in Toronto as well, five and two-thirds of three-run ball with also six Ks. Hopefully a little better in this one, but I will take a quality start from Grayson Rodriguez. And you can listen to every single pitch of the Orioles radio broadcast from game one of the O's and the J's on the SXM app through Sirius XM. Just download the app and search Orioles. But that'll do it for today. Back tomorrow, recapping game one between the Orioles and the Blue Jays. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.